All right, well, it looks like we're right on two o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and welcome to Cafe Conversations, hosted by the Office of Philanthropy and Alumni and the Cafe Alumni Association. For those of you that haven't been on before, I'm Elizabeth Vaughn. I'm the Associate Senior Director of Philanthropy for the college. And uh, as all of you know, February is Black History Month. So we have Jim Coleman, owner of Coleman Crest Farm, and Ashley Smith, co-founder of Black Soil, here with us today. And they're going to talk about Black agriculture in Kentucky and tell us a little bit about their stories as well. Uh, and before I turn it over to Jim to get us started, just a reminder to everybody, if you have a question during the presentation, uh, feel free to post it in the chat function. And so we will go ahead and get started. Jim, you wanna kick us off? Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I will pull up my presentation here and uh, we'll get right to it. Maybe uh, let me know when you all have, when you see it. There we go. Well, uh, as Elizabeth was saying, I am uh, Jim Coleman, the owner of uh, Coleman Crest Farm. Uh, it's been in business since 1888. And I'll share with you all about the story as well as to give you an update on what are some of the things that we're focused on right now. Um, as you all know, uh, the uh, transatlantic uh, slave trade was uh, from 1500 all the way up to 1866. And as you can see, uh, there was a migration to the United States as well as, uh, you know, the Caribbean and uh, South America. Um, I uh, originally, my family is from Nigeria, and I just recently did some research and found out that I'm 50% Nigerian. And so my family came from Nigeria to the United States, landed in Spotsylvania, Virginia. Uh, they were owned by the Dorsen family in uh, Spotsylvania, Virginia. Um, and then uh, from there, they had a daughter named Mary, and she moved to Lexington, and she met and married a man named Coleman. And the reason, my, the reason why my name is Coleman is that at the time, my ancestors were owned by the Dorsen family. So they went from being Dorsons to being Coleman's. I had a great uncle that used to tell this story on a verbal basis, but I did research, and I found that uh, what he was sharing on the verbal side was actually true. Uh, and it met right up with exactly what he had been saying for years. In 1865, once uh, the 13th Amendment was uh, ratified by all the states, uh, my great-grandfather and his family received their freedom. He was uh, born uh, in Spotsylvania, Virginia in 1845. His name was James Coleman. Uh, again, he moved here with uh, Mary Dorson and he brought his family. He also married a woman by the name of Lucy Ward. And uh, they had six children, four sons and two daughters. Uh, they uh, worked out on the farm that is today Coleman Crest Farm. Uh, and he had uh, three options that he had in 1888. He was about 41 years old. The first option was, hey, you know, I don't have an education, don't know how to read and write. I don't have access to financing uh, at 53rd Bank or Chase Manhattan to be able to get a loan to buy anything. I can't join the chamber, can't go to UK right now. Maybe my great great granddaughter might be able to one day, but I can't right now. He could have concluded, you know what? There's not a lot uh, for me to do here in America. And could have just said, you know what? I'm just not gonna make it. That's the way life is. Second option that he had at the time was Congressman Henry Clay had formulated the American Colonization Society and that allowed all free blacks who wanted to leave America to leave. I had a relative, his name was William D. Colvin, who's also out there on the farm. Uh, he and his mother left and uh, joined several others uh, out of New Orleans and they crossed the Atlantic. It took six months for them to get to the coast of Liberia. You can see there, that's Monrovia, which is the capital of Liberia. And then 12 miles in, that's where the 40 square miles were. It was called Clay Ashley, right after Henry Clay, as well as the name of his plantation here in Lexington. And, uh, you know, if I were back then, I probably would have jumped on number two. The option number two was kind of like going to Silicon Valley. You're out of here. You're escaping oppression. Uh, you're going to go to a new country uh, that you can start and build yourself. And I recently, just in the last five years, met my ancestors while I was on tour down in Prince George's County leading up the Economic Development Corporation. I went to the Liberian Embassy and I met uh, a lady, the lady there in the orange. Her name is Fatima Coleman. And I met with the ambassador and explained the same story and Fatima started crying. She said, I can't believe this. She said, we've been trying to find the Coleman's in Kentucky forever. 
And she said, we've got a family reunion each year. And I said, when is the next one? She said, it's in three weeks. And I said, where? She said, it's going to be in Bowie, Maryland. Well, at the time, that was about five miles from the apartment I was living in. And so this represented the first family reunion. And I've been there each time uh, over the last five years to the family reunion. The lady that you're seeing there in the blue, she is the granddaughter of William D. Coleman. Her name is Genevieve Coleman. Uh, that's her son. Uh, and Fatima, and they gave, Ms., gave me this beautiful dashiki to welcome me into the family. So that was the second option, which was to retreat and to go to Liberia. The third was to seize the moment, and that's what my great-grandfather decided to do. Uh, instead of focusing on all the things that were uh, not perfect uh, that were going on in the country with a lot of oppression, he decided to focus on what is it that I can do, and thank God for Booker T. Washington he created the uh, Union Benevolent Society, and it was popping up all over the United States. It was connected to the Black Church, where African Americans were pulling their money together. The little bit of money that they had, they would pull it together to give each other loans to either buy land or to bury loved ones. I've got records that show uh, that shows where my family took out loans for both. Well, James Coleman and Lucy took out a loan uh, for twelve hundred dollars, and they bought the farm that they had tilled from John and Mary Darnaby. And I like to say that was the day that I was conceived as well as 300 of his other descendants because we all were able to directly go to college as a result of taking loans out on this farm, which a lot of farmers do no matter what nationality you're in, uh, as well as uh, using the proceeds to send uh, kids to college. Uh, it paid for my college 100%, uh, as well as indirectly many of the ancestors, if it were not for this strategic purchase, many of them would not have the opportunities that they've enjoyed today. Uh, one generation later, John Coleman, who was one of James Coleman's sons, that's him in the middle. He's there on the farm. They built this beautiful house. It looks like Hamburg Place. Uh, that's Molly. Her name was Molly Jackson. That's my grandmother. The little guy that you see down there in the middle, his name is Sam Coleman. That's my father. And uh, the one over there to the right is Ben. That's one of my favorite uncles. And uh, the little girl there, her name is Anna. They had a total of seven kids but many of them had left to, quite frankly, go off to college. Uh, and these three were still left and they were raising them. This picture was taken in about 1927 uh, when the economy was bad, everyone was having a tough time, but because we own land, we were able to be sustainable, both in generating incomes uh, from the various uh, production of livestock, as well as produce and tobacco that we were selling, as well as uh, they were able to take loans out. And I have documentation from all the loans they took out to send their kids to college. Uh, this is John and Molly's uh, sons and daughters. This is the night before my parents were married, uh, February the 3rd, 1950. I like to say this is the picture of the Kennedys here, but it is the Coleman's of uh, Coleman Crest. And the little guy down there that's laughing and all happy, that's my father. Uh, the one that you see up there with, uh, right there putting his hand kind of in his coat, that's Uncle Stanford. He went to school with, uh, with Thurgood Marshall at Lincoln University. Uh, this is my uh, Uncle uh, Jim and Uncle Ben. I like to say of all the ones, he was probably the wealthiest because he worked as a butler, lived as a rich man. He worked for Henry Knight, who was a big insurance man. And he later got into the insurance business as well. Uh, this is Anna, his sister. Uh, she uh, moved to Cincinnati and she's got kids all over the country that are doing extraordinary things. Uh, this is Ada Malden. I'm sorry, this is Ada Coleman. Uh, Smith, and she lived in Richmond, Virginia. She became a principal in Richmond. And then the one over there that's laughing, his name is Cliff. And they uh, took out a note for $500 to send Cliff to Morehouse College. And that's when they almost lost the farm. The note was $7 a month. You might think, why couldn't they pay seven? Because at the time, generating $7 a month as a farmer was tough. Um, and so they almost lost the farm. Thank God Molly talked in tongues and prayed like crazy when the banker came up to foreclose. He took off running and never came back. And uh, they were able to preserve the farm as well as to pay off that note that they had. But this is uh, pretty much the foundation of the 300 kids after that, that all of them were able to send their kids to college. But the picture that you're seeing here, these people were successful as a direct result of agriculture and the production that we had at Coleman Crest Farm. Uh, that's the next day when my parents got married, Sam and Cleo. I called her cupcakes all of my life. My grandfather there to the right, my uh, mother's father, he uh, was the king of Dewey Street, had a lot of restaurants and bars. And uh, that was, I guess, in 1945, he had a total of $100,000. He was a very successful 
businessman, and he was very particular on who his daughters would end up marrying. So because my father owned Coleman Crest Farm, he went to Kentucky State. They met there, graduated in 1949. Um, they ended up falling in love. Uh, my mother loved his business mind and his love for agriculture and his love for Kentucky and wanting to have a family. And so this was a beautiful day. My parents ended up having five kids with me being one of them. Uh, the one that uh, I'd like to share this slide, this is the house that my parents built uh, in 1950. My father served in World War II, so he got a loan to be able to build this beautiful ranch house. And that's the look of the farm from 1950 to about 1990. Uh, and this is pretty much how I grew up. This is what I remember seeing in the farm. And we had cows, sheep, pigs, dogs. Uh, we had chickens. We had everything that you could think of to sell, fully uh, a diversified list of crops. We sold tobacco, hay. Uh, we had a tractor. We had, I just, after coming back home, from 42 years ago, getting back uh, last August, I am amazed at how much my father was able to get done. This spin concept that's hot out there, urban farming, my father wrote that about 50 years ago, and it's something I'm trying to understand uh, today on how I can bring back uh, the life of the farm and get the kind of productivity that he got, because he was able to do uh, the things necessary on this farm to send all of his kids to college. Uh, Ruth, my oldest sister, she graduated from the University of Kentucky in 1977. Uh, she was born and raised, of course, uh, with the rest of us out there on the farm. That's her down there at the bottom, as well as at the top. That was in 1952 when my mother and my cousin Stanford came down for a visit from Dayton. My brother Bubba, my mother was holding, and that's Ruth when she was about two and a half years old. Uh, Ruth graduated from Bryan Station High School in 68, started her academic career uh, at Transylvania. And then she completed two years as a math major and realized she can make a lot of money as an engineer. She even used to say, you know, you can make more money with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering than a PhD in math. So she uh, left Transylvania and transferred over to the University of Kentucky. And that's where she studied civil engineering. And she was the first woman and the first African-American to graduate uh, from the university's uh, civil engineering program. And from there, she went on to get her PE, her professional engineering license, and she worked for Bechtel, Parsons, and also she's been an independent professional engineer. She's retired now and lives up in Alaska. And the reason why she's up in Alaska, she worked for about 10 to 15 years up there on the Alaskan pipeline. She's built everything from uh, pipelines to roads, highways, bridges, uh, as well as nuclear power plants. And so she is quite a trailblazer and someone that gave me the encouragement when I was young to uh, study uh, science and uh, math and uh, to do well in school. So uh, after all of my older siblings left, Ruth and Bub and Coley, I was left at the age of 12. I was the manager of the farm. My father said, uh, you know, you're now the manager. I said, well, daddy, what am I, gonna, what am I gonna get paid? He said, well, you're gonna get three hots and a flop. Three hots, and for many of you, you may not know, that means breakfast, lunch, and dinner on the house and uh, a bed to sleep in. And I was proud. I loved working on the farm and I loved being the owner. And he said, you're in charge. Your job is to feed the pigs and to take care of everything. And so when I took over, the pigs looked like this. They were kind of hungry. We could only grow so much on the farm. And we also had to buy extra feed from southern states. And because my brothers, they were only able to feed a certain amount uh, due to my father's tight controls on expenses, the pigs were pretty hungry. And they used to break out a lot and they would go over into our neighbor's fields and root up the fields. And so I quickly learned all you have to do is just give them more feed that we were buying from Southern states of which I tripled the amount. And in 90 days, they were looking great. My father came up to the barn and said, look at y'all, these are the biggest hogs we've ever had. And I said, I'm doing my job. He said, you're doing your job, but you're gonna break us. And so what he did is to go to the Saratoga restaurant. Uh, they had a backup in their kitchen of slop. Uh, the city was charging $5 a barrel to pick it up. And uh, they were only picking it up once per week. And my father said, we can do a lot better. We can pick it up every day, pay us the $5 and we'll eliminate your problem. That eliminated all of our cost for raising pigs. And then after another 90 days, our pigs looked like this and ready for market. And the beautiful thing of this is this is what CEOs are trying to do every day. Eliminate cost, find new revenue streams because our hogs got so fat, they stopped eating all the slop. And I told my father, look, we're getting rats up at the barn if we don't get rid of all this slop. He had me to get in the truck to drive up and down the road to sell the extra slot. And we sold the extra slot for $5 a barrel. And that's what sent me to college. And that all paid. We uh, raised about $5,000 from the time I was 12 till about 16. 
and he took out a note for $5,000 for a total of $10,000, and that paid for my four years to go to Howard University, where my mother wanted me to go to Howard. I want to share this today. I you know, got some feedback. Some of, some of you are concerned about how can we help to develop youth here? This is what I learned on the farm. I, it was the 20th century, but I learned 21st century uh, job skills by being raised on the farm, critical thinking, uh, creativity, collaboration. Just that one case study, I learned a lot about uh, the right kinds of skills so that when I went off to college as well as the future jobs I had, I was really prepared. And that's what I want to do for youth here in Lexington. As a result of uh, my father sacrificing and pulling all the money together and my mother's vision of me going to Howard University, you know, uh, I applied and I didn't get in uh, at first. They turned me down and my mother said, they don't know what they've done. They, she wrote, uh, this guy here is President Cheek. She wrote President Cheek a letter and said, if you give him one year of a chance on probation, we'll pay for the four years as well as we'll bring him home because he's gonna be successful and he will make you very proud one day. So I went from being a college reject at Howard to the time when I graduated in 1983, Dr. Cheek was giving me the who's who of colleges, uh, students and American colleges and universities. And it really taught me a lot about perseverance and being focused and working on the controllables. And this was a very special day. Down there at the bottom is a picture of my mother-in-law and my wife, Kathy. And that's also to the left there is a picture of all of my other family members. I put the robe on my father because I said, Daddy, you paid for it, so I'm going to let you have it. It's your diploma. And this was just a very special day. Also, while I was there I, and at Howard University, I learned a lot about leadership, and I ran for the Liberal Arts Student Council. And I want to tell you another quick little story as it relates to um, you know, Black History Month. This is a flyer that I used to get the message out about my campaign. And I had this campaign manager's name was Rodney Bell down here at the bottom. He said, uh, you know, we've got to find a way to get this flyer out. I said, no, we can't go to the women's dorms. We can't go upstairs and hand them out. What do you think we can do about it? He said, you know what? I've got about seven or eight girls that I know that could probably help us. And so the next night at the library, we had a meeting with these eight girls that he had invited to this meeting. And I was telling them all about what I wanted to do. I'm going to hold the line on tuition. I'm not going to let the tuition raise costs. We're gonna get more out of the administration. We're gonna make sure the administration's accountable to the student body. And they all were like excited. So much so that one of the students at the end of the meeting right here, this young lady right here, she walked up to the table where I had about 300 of flyers that I was gonna have them to hand out. And she was giggling and she said, I love what you had to say. I believe in what you have to say. And I want to hand out flyers to help you to win. I said, I really appreciate that. And I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from San Francisco. I said, wow, what part of San Francisco? North, South, she was telling me all about the city. And I said, well, what is your name? She said, my name is Kamala Harris. And I said, well, Kamala, thank you for being on my team. And please get these flyers out. She said, I'm going to. And she giggled and rushed over to the quad and hand out the flyers and called us the next day uh, to say she even needed more flyers. And it just says so much about, you know, the power of one that if my great grandfather didn't seize the moment and if, if, if my father and mother didn't sacrifice and hold on to the farm, I wouldn't have been able to go to Howard University and I wouldn't have met the next vice president of the United States, the first woman and first black uh, person to be the vice president of the United States. I saw her two years ago on the day that she announced her run for the presidency and she saw me and I hadn't seen her for 40 years and in a crowd, she ran up to me nose to nose James Coleman, you look the same. I said, so do you, Kamala. And it was an incredible day. But it just it's just an incredible ride that I've had because of agriculture here in Kentucky. I had a chance to work for these four corporations and learned more on a formal level over the last 35 years, uh, Oscar Mayer, Pepsi, Philip Morris, and American Express. And then last August, I recently decided to relocate back to Lexington to restore my family farm I do want to let you in on a little bit of sad news that my wife of uh, 32 years, Kathy, uh, who was my partner for more than the 32 years plus in college, uh, she passed away. And she's listening in today uh, via the internet from heaven. And I know she's excited about all the things we're doing at Coleman Crest because she's one of the main uh, individuals in my life that allowed me to hold on to the farm. We purchased it from my mother uh, in 2001. And we didn't have any crops growing. It basically turned into a forest. And my wife, with all of her help, helped me to pay the bills and to keep it going until I could get down here to care for it. I want to kind of now shift gears, and I'll kind of wrap this up, Elizabeth, with you know going through these last few slides. 
Uh, but I wanted to let you know the steps I'm going through on the renovation of the farm. First of all, you've got to have a team of advisors. And I'm pleased to let you all know these are active advisors. Dr. Mia Farrell, she's been out to, to the farm about five times. The dean, Dean Cox, has been out to the farm. I mean, I had a, a meeting with her and her team, this group here, up at my mother, uh, my grandparents' grave, which is on our farm. And uh, we had, uh, you know, pull out seats and talking and talking about the history of the farm. And she gave me so many great ideas and direction on resources. And Dr. Kessler and Danielle was there. The two Heathers have been on it. Just, you know, today's Thursday. I, I sent an email out uh, to Heather and Heather uh, on, what was it, Tuesday, as well as David, letting them know that we're moving quickly on our plan for production for this year. And I would like to have an analysis done on my well. I sent that out at about 10 a.m. I'm sorry, 10 p.m. on Tuesday night. And uh, 8.48 the following morning, I got a response from Scott Aldrich about, I can meet with you. Let's meet on Friday at your, uh, it's going to be Thursday tomorrow on my farm at 10 a.m. And it just says so much about how fast uh, they respond. And it's just my team. I could not do it uh, without this advisory board. And I'm also pleased to let you know that I put together a great team that's going to help me to get the team cranking. Uh, I met Eric Walls. He and his wife, Gail, saw me on television talking about the farm, and they called me. They live down there on Bryan Station Road. He's the owner of a farm called Eric's Organics. It's an organic farm, and they've had tremendous success over the last 15 years. He's got about 25 to 30 customers. And he said, look, I'm weaning myself out. I'd love to talk to you about how we can help you to be successful with your farm, as well as I'd like for you to take on some of our customers. I'm like, you can't beat that. I haven't even started. And he already has introduced me to Ramsey's Diner and they want to buy two tons of okra. And so uh, in meeting them, I also had a chance to meet their son, Grant uh, Walls, who is a, a junior at the University of Kentucky in the agriculture department. This guy is a wizard. He is the Elon Musk of farming. He is so wound up and fired up about being an intern with me this summer. I mean, I'm learning as much from him as he's learning from me. I want to make sure that he's got those 21st century corporate skills that I've learned uh, through my 32 years. And I need his immediate help on farming. He's excited about some of the high tech things that we're going to be doing that I'll share with you in a moment. And he's going to be with me starting uh, in May, right after graduation through September. Uh, Jakethia Johnson, just a smart individual that is a senior getting ready to graduate uh, this coming May going to work at the USDA out in Nebraska. But while she's uh, still here, she's agreed to be my agribusiness advisor. She's already cracking me on getting things signed with grants and things that I would have ordinarily procrastinated on. And she's just been a rock star in helping me. And then I've got my little protege, Emmanuel Cooper, who I met through Lexington Powell. He's in the eighth grade at Bryan Station Junior High School. And he's going to be the first agriculture scholar, the Coleman Crest Farm agriculture scholar. He's going to come out to the farm this summer and he wants to go to Howard University and then uh, to Harvard University for law school and I'm going to help him to get that done. Kathy and I, in her memory, I've decided to set up a, a scholarship fund. It's right now a total of two million dollars. Thank God for Kathy's investment skills, uh, but it's going to be available to help students to be able to pay for their tuition and it's called the Kathy uh, James Coleman Scholarship Fund at Howard University. Uh, to help, and he's going to be the first recipient uh, to go to Howard University to get uh, his uh, degree in political science. Um, just very excited about meeting him. But that's my team, and here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to go both the conventional route with, uh, you know, having the spin farming going on, small plot intensive at the farm. The equipment that you're seeing is the plotter, the cover that, uh, thank goodness for the Walls family, Eric and his son brought the equipment up. We're already building the beds. Um, we're going to do it even more once the, you know, once it gets a little bit warmer, we're going to start April the 14th and planting the okra. That's why I've told uh, our friends Heather and Heather uh, that we've got to have the well up and running by March 19th so that we can start the water. Uh, we're going to start planting the other crops, which will be tomatoes and some types of lettuces uh, later on in May. But uh, okra is more of a, a product that you can start earlier in the year and the earlier, the better, and you can get the better yield. So we're going to be looking at okra, leafy greens, cabbage, uh, as well as tomatoes. And uh, Ramses has said, we'll buy as much as you can pump out. We're also going to have an incubator farm in partnering with, uh, with Lexington Powell, as well as the uh, first uh, individual. Her name is Ginger. 
uh, Ginger Darnaby. She is the descendant of John Darnaby, who sold the farm to my great grandfather. She wants to be one of the first incubator farmers on our farm. And I've already told her, look, you don't even have to worry. I won't even charge your soul sister. And it's about reconciliation and she's excited. And so she and her husband are gonna take over about a quarter of an acre and they're gonna grow. And our focus is helping people to understand how to grow and generate at least $50,000 plus in gross sales by growing the right crops. We're also at Coleman Crest taking a look at the uh, freight container hydroponics program. I'm going into Community Trust Bank. Keep your fingers crossed for me because we're going to ask them tomorrow for $164,000 to launch this program. <clears throat> it totally controls uh, Mother Nature. I was up in Indianapolis taking a look at it. You can see me there where you can control the lighting. You can control the temperature. Uh, the well water would be fantastic because you can control the water. You can control the nitrogen, the pH level, no pest and no weeds. And uh, we're looking to launch this uh, and to have it at the farm probably in about nine months. It takes seven months to have it produced. So we're expecting it to be at the farm probably by late September or November, sometime between September and November based on the production. But it's a cool program. It's gonna allow us to have production and availability of our crops. Wonderful companies like Black Soil can't wait to be able to buy lettuce from us. We're gonna pump out uh, everything from butterhead to romaine lettuces as well as other types of lettuces once we can get started. We're looking at somewhere between 14 to 15,000 a month in gross sales with a net of about $9,000. So we're excited about this new concept and bringing it to Lexington. Uh, and then I'll speed it up to give my partner a chance to talk. This just shows you what we're doing at Coleman uh, Crest to be committed to especially youth who are disadvantaged youth. We've had already some success in working with Lexington Powell. Uh, that's police athletic. I'm sorry, Police Activities League, and they're partnering with us to bring their youth out. They've got about 800 youth, probably about 50 to 60 of them will be interested in coming out to the farm. We're going to have a big day on March the 12th, where Kubota Tractor uh, Corporation is producing a documentary on our farm about the history of the farm. And we're inviting Lexington Powell youth to come out that day to learn about our tractor and our equipment, as well as the history of the farm. And we'll be having other events for them throughout the year of helping them to get informed and exposed about agriculture here in Lexington. So to wrap it up, key takeaways that we're pushing for our youth, as well as all of my team members is to seize the moment, never quit, never retreat. Like my great grandfather, he seized the moment. Uh, we're building individual and organizational skills. I wanna make sure that the team members I'm bringing on, that I'm developing their skills, not just in farming, but good business skills and good leadership skills. I want them to know their purpose and I hope it's gonna end up being uh, agriculture. I want them to learn to focus on the controllables, study winners. I do this all day, like the Walls family, they've had tremendous success. I wanna replicate their success versus starting from scratch. And then I'm encouraging them to hang with positive people that our five best friends are who we really are. We're the average of our five best friends. And so that's what I wanted to share today, uh, Elizabeth, and that wraps up uh, my presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. That was incredible, I can't believe I mean, you could kind of say you launched Kamala Harris's political career. I, I mean, that's did. pretty amazing. <laughs> Unbelievable. I did. She yeah. would probably agree with that, quite frankly. She, <laughs> right. she probably would. She would give yeah. me a credit. That's she amazing. Would. She Amongst is just a wonderful friend still today. And it just says so much about her that she can remember her friends. I mean, 40 years, it was 42 years, and I hadn't even seen her. And, you know, we just kept each, kept up with each other on, you know, uh, online and seeing her on CNN. But for her to come in an audience up to me to say, you look the same, James Coleman. What are you doing? I said, you look the same too, Kamala. That's Goodness, right. It was an incredible day. Yeah, so, that's awesome. That's what I want to do for our students here at UK and, you know, for the students that I impact. I want them to have this same kind of experience. I want to help to show aspiring farmers how they can make a living through agriculture. I told Dr. Cox that I want Coleman Crest to be the most profitable farm per acre in the state of Kentucky. And I'm gonna get that done within the next three years. Yeah, that's some awesome goals. And I know our students love those opportunities to interact and be hands-on. So. Yes, so, thank you for this opportunity, Elizabeth. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna turn it over now to Ashley to talk a little bit about black soil and kind of what they do. I will say I saw some very delicious looking donuts from North Lime Donuts this week. 
that involve black soil. So Ashley, I'll let you kick it off. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I know we are getting close to our finale of our event today. So I just briefly want to capture your attention. Black soil exists to ask the question, if mother nature can't see who puts the seed in the ground, then why do we have such enormous disparities in agriculture? Being unable to shake that question three years ago, Black Soul, Our Better Nature was established with the mission to reconnect Black Kentuckians to their heritage and legacy in agriculture, much like you heard today in Mr. Coleman's presentation. Uh, Coleman Crest, we've been working with since uh, 2018, and it's just been amazing to watch the journey that really, again, roots us into our mission not only to reconnect folks to their heritage and legacy but to also increase the market share and carve out um, procurement opportunities for the 1.4 percent of producers here in the state um, and so here's the team that makes up Black Soil. We are co a co-founded organization. Our co-founder's name is Trevor Claiborne. He is an employee of Kentucky State University Extension. And for six years, he's traveled across the country working with urban and rural youth, connecting them to careers in agriculture and using multimedia um, to express that education and outreach. Uh, myself, I'm an alumnus of the university. My degree is in sociology, so I'm coming as an, a, an industry outsider, um, wanting to really connect communities from point A to point B. And our second generation of Black soil, uh, you'll probably hear in the background or running in the corners of the video, um, our little pudgies, Caroline and Trevor Jr. So long story short, um, again, 2020 through all of us for a loop, but because we've been working and building relationships over 31 counties for now four years this August, we were able to root our farmers who represent um, over 60 Kentucky-based brands, farmers, culinary artists, and makers, where we continue to carve out this problem that looks at food insecurity, uh, land dispossession, land loss, and then really, again, getting to the nitty gritty of our value added proposition. If Mother Nature is a, uh, you know, a colorblind, unable to see who's with the color of the skin of the producer placing that seed into the ground or cultivating production, we have to understand that here in the state of Kentucky, Black farm products are valued at a little over $10 million compared to their white counterparts product valuation at over $5 billion. So again, working at the margins of being 1.4% or around 433 out of 77,000 total producers here in the state of Kentucky, we're based in a historic narrative that that looks at our shared agrarian history, our beloved sectors of hemp, tobacco, equine, and distilling that set us forth on a journey in Hart County where four of the seven, seven siblings of the Barber uh, family have returned to farm at Barber's Farm, a 150 acre black owned farm in Canmer, Kentucky where formerly they raised tobacco were a dairy producing farm. Now they have a CSA and a, a farm store in Munfordville that pulls from 15 to 20 other rural based farmers in the region. And we are motivated to continue this work now moving more and more away from agritourism, which, you know, breaks my heart because of COVID, but we honed in and we focused on our CSA program that focuses on connecting households, small locally owned farm to table restaurants, um, institutions such as the university with these Kentucky-based farmers. And we continue working in our services such as the historic interpretation of agriculture that looks at our modern fascination with hemp, but we can't overlook its roots and how enslaved black men across the state of Kentucky made the great compromiser Henry Clay and other political and historic figures much of their wealth and affluence. So to hear the direct connection between Coleman Crest Farm and how Mr. Coleman has basically pieced together the traces and the connectivity that again embodies our vision and our mission. And again, we work across the state of 31 counties. As I looked at the participant list, I see some of those farmers have joined us today. Uh, Silver Springs Farm, Equine and Vineyard, Miss Leslie and Alan Carter in Bracktown. 
we have Thompson Family Farm in Scott County. Mr. Ed Thompson, if you're not familiar, is the USDA 1890 liaison at Kentucky State University and a FFA legend in his own right. So again, we work with diverse um, producers who raise specialty crops, seasonal produce, freezer meat, local meats, feeder calves, value added products that look at taking the uh, raw uh, ag products that we love and creating a finished product. So here uniquely, again, um, echoing the presentation of Mr. Coleman going before us here in Lexington, Fayette County, we have unique settlements um, in our rural and our urban areas called hamlets, these post-Civil War settlements where former enslavers parceled out and made their former enslaved individuals buy land in which they at one point in time worked for no compensation. So Coleman Crest located in Utterin Town, we've mentioned and again, Silver Springs Farm, Equine and Vineyard in Bracktown, Slack Market Farm in Athens, Green Landing located here in Lexington in Caden Town. Um, we continue echoing the heritage and legacy of African-American foodways through working with culinary artists and chefs such as Chef Lawrence Weeks at Honeywood, Angelia Drake, Chef Chris Kane. These um, culinary artists bring forth more, even more life to our seasonal produce by cultivating farm to table dinners, uh, meal kits, meal prep that are EBT eligible. Makers again to echo um, the continuation of our food system and really stretching out um, the life of our seasonal produce and our Kentucky farm products to ensure we're doing everything we can to reduce waste. Um, these makers keep those lifelines going, such as being together, Honey, a 14-year-old beekeeper based in West Louisville. So again, I know we are uh, over on our time today, and I will conclude uh, my presentation, but I did want to exalt and lift up the farms, the uh, food brands, as well as the value-added product vendors that we've worked with now since August of 2017. So uh, again, thank you so much to the college for the opportunity to present today, and we appreciate the opportunity to share more. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And we, we are kind of bumping up against our time limit here. Uh, for those of you that have some more time and want to stay on, we had some questions submitted both in the chat pod and before we got started. Uh, Jim and Ashley, if you guys have a few minutes, I'd love to maybe try to address a few of those. Sure. Ashley, are you good on time? Perfect. All right. So one of the first questions that we got was uh, from a teacher that had, we heard from several teachers talking about how, you know, they wanted to share this with their class, but one of the teachers asked, as a teacher looking to encourage students, specifically boys of color, to enter into agriculture as a career field, what are some of the pieces of advice you either wish you knew before you entered this field or some current business industry partners that are looking to get involved with agricultural youth? Okay. I'll let Ashley go. Ashley, you can go first. Hey, our experience through Black Soil and Farmer Brown VMC programming have really uh, emphasized representation. So students being spurred on and a confidence fostered by seeing presenters, educators, workshop featured uh, individuals who reflect their experience, their cultural um, heritage, as well as allowing for these students to have hands-on application. So I reviewed the questions prior and the, the educator who asked this um, works at an academy that is dedicated to serving uh, young men of color um, with educational opportunities in agriculture. So obviously those types of critical infrastructures and support systems um, are what will need to be in place to help make that pivot and encourage more people to come back into the industry in the sector. Okay. I would like to add to what uh, Ashley said and I agree with everything that she has said. Uh, I would like to partner with schools. Uh, Ashley's already shared some ideas with me as a partner of mine and. Uh, strategically reaching out to especially elementary and middle schools to invite them out for ag days as soon as we can uh, to give exposure to the students. We're going to be doing this with Lexington Powell to invite the students to come out and learn and get in the dirt. Many students, uh, especially in the inner city, have never even been out to a farm and they don't know anything about the soil. So coming out and getting exposure 
can really strike up their interest in agriculture. Um, the second thing is to have these summer internships. I'm uh, taking the lead with bringing out Emmanuel and some of our students at the University of Kentucky, but I would love to partner with uh, any of the schools to invite as many students out. I need as much help as possible, uh, both in the hard work as well as in their brain power of knowing how to, like Grant, put together a spreadsheet for me on all of our crops within an hour in real time while we run a, uh, a Zoom call. And uh, I, I need that kind of brain power. I'm tapped. I'm at about 15.9 gigs, and I've only got 16 gigs of operating space. And so I would love to invite our youth to come out and use their brain power, as well as to give them a chance to get in the dirt and help me to produce some great crop product and, and to share in the success of it. Great. And so this question is very specific for you, Ashley. Um, someone had asked what percentage of Kentucky's black farmers belong to or work with black soil? So over the summer, um, so again, in 2017, we started off building a relationship with one farm family. And there we have grown to working now, again, in 31 counties work directly on a continuous basis in regards to purchasing, sourcing from a good 15 to 20 farms. Now total, when we um, extended out around 31,000 in one time COVID-19 grants, those went out to 51 Kentucky Black fam farm families. So I would say around 60 to 80 um, within the network that we have access to communicating with on a regular basis. Fantastic. I'd like to, Elizabeth, if I can, to give a plug to Black Soil. Not only are they a good partner on the distribution side, uh, Ashley's an excellent PR executive and helped me tremendously in building awareness about our farm. I would not know Eric Walls or Grant if uh, Ashley didn't get me on the television shows here in Lexington to build awareness. She was in charge of our uh, groundbreaking on September the 15th and just getting more awareness out in the market can help not only a black farmer, but any farmer. So that when you go in and you're talking to customers, it's not the first time they've heard about you. And so that's a, just a tremendous value that black soil offers. It's, it's a very comprehensive firm. And I encourage anybody out there to, uh, whether if you're black or any other nationality to use black soil uh, as a partner. Yeah, that's fantastic. So a question specific for you, Mr. Coleman, came in during the presentation asking kind of along those lines of the distribution piece, you had mentioned that Ramsey's was buying, you know, a few tons of your okra. Yeah. Where do you sell most of your products and how much of your job is spent just finding buyers yeah. for your products? That's a good question. I would like for uh, the target markets that I'm going after are going to be farm to table restaurants, those restaurants that want to have good, fresh local product. Uh, so directly with the restaurants. Uh, and also I wanna work with great firms like Black Soil, uh, who are wholesalers to firms who want to get a good continuous flow uh, of good freshly grown local product that's organic. And so uh, that's gonna be a big help to be able to sell to Ashley because she's got some really large clients. And you know if I can get this uh, brand new concept launched we can even sell in off season. So that's gonna be great for Ashley and certainly great for Coleman Crest. And then of course, I want to sell through farmer's markets. I want to be the king when I go out to Lexington farmer's markets, I'm gonna get out in front of the booth and talk about Coleman Crest. As I visited the various farmer's markets, you know, a lot of the farmers are like kind of hiding behind their tables and you have to really get them to come out and talk. That's not going to be a problem for me. Emmanuel's going to be counting the money, and I'm going to be out front talking about the product and selling it and getting it sold directly to our consumers, as well as I'm going to be setting up a CSA with our church, Uttinger Town Baptist Church. There are a lot of our uh, uh, members of our community that want to buy the product there locally, so I look forward to setting that up. So that's the way we're going to be selling, and I'll be using my selling skills that I've learned over the last 30 years to approach these various uh, freight companies and customers that we're gonna have. Yeah, absolutely. I know CSAs have just seen an absolute boom over the last year or so. I think uh, I'd heard some statistics and I don't have them committed to memory, but I mean, multiple I know around Lexington were had waiting lists early on, That's which right. is 
fantastic. Perhaps that's one good thing about COVID. It's made us, you know, rethink food in some mm. ways. And so that's exactly hopefully right. that's a boom to a lot of our local farmers. So that's right. We will wrap up with one last question here that was submitted in advance. How can mostly white communities better support BIPOC farmers, um, you know, and really maybe just local farmers in general? And so what is the role of mostly white communities in helping spur maybe systematic change in mm -hmm. across agriculture? Number one, talk about our farms, get this uh, link out to as many of your friends as possible, share it on your Facebook page so that the community knows about Black Soil and Coleman Crest and these other farms that, you know, Ashley mentioned. Uh, so building awareness about us is a big help Two, buying from us. When you go to a farmer's market, buy from us, you know, and tell everybody if you like the product, tell as many friends as possible. Three, if you've got any way to be a sponsor to help me to cover some of the costs for these internships, I can hire more people. I've got Emmanuel and Grant on board. I'm hoping I'm going to have a good season to be able to help to offset the cost. But right now, that's coming out of my pocket 100 percent. And I would like to, you know, if, if I can't get it out of the volume of the sales, which I think I will, uh, it would be great to get any kind of support, financial support from the corporate community to be able to help us to get our students hired at these, not just Coleman Crest, but Ashley's, these other farms. Uh, and the other farms may not even realize it. I've, I've already, it's given me a lift in my brain power to be able to know that I've got Ashley, Jakeitha, as well as Emmanuel on board. And you can take your business to a whole nother level, but it would be great to get any kind of sponsorship or help to be able to help finance that it would be a big win for us. And a big win for the youth. Ashley, anything you want to add? We can end it with that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well, I see that we already have some comments in our chat about people looking forward to meeting you guys at farmers markets and local yes. events when we can get back out. And, wait. Yes, do some of those things. So thank you both so much for presenting today. I, you know, this is certainly informative for me and I'm sure for the rest of our audience. Um, for anyone that does want to share this after the fact, uh, we will send out a link to the recording for everybody. So you'll be able to share widely um, and we do encourage you to do that. And we hope that you will all be able to join us on our next installment of Cafe Conversations. We're gonna be talking about all things water and it's amazing how much water there is in this state and how much shoreline we have and so we hope you'll come learn a little bit about that on March 23rd at 2 p.m. You'll get an email invitation, but go ahead and save the date on your calendar. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thanks. See you later, Ashley. Thank you all. Have a great one. Bye-bye.